no idea. All right. It's working now. Okay. Pray for the buffering, folks. And this shirt. How's this shirt, dude? What's going on here? Okay. Pray for the buffering that the Lord Jesus Christ will bless the internet connection, that the modem is warmed up. This is a weird shirt, man. I don't get it. All right. Is the lighting okay? Do you want me to make it a little more light? You guys need more light? Can you hear me? Sorry. I got Bruce Lee here. Okay, if it's okay, that's fine. As I said, I'd either do a live stream early or later, depending on when David Wood would go live. Now, Lord Jesus willing, we're going to do another live stream tomorrow. If the Lord wills, tomorrow, David Wood and I will be doing a live stream tomorrow, refuting the rest of Adnan Rashid's nonsense. So let's just wait for a few more minutes for the regulars to show up. We had 1,500 in this channel. If I get 500, I'll be shocked. But may the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. We're up to 200 plus. Hopefully it increases for the glory of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I did say I was going to discuss being born again. But I decided to do another session on Jesus being worshipped as God. And Lord Jesus willing, I will discuss being born again. I didn't finish the series. I have to finish it by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's wait. Invite people. Be prayed up and get ready. We're going to go into some meat if the Lord is pleased. Go into some meat. This guy's name is confusing me. Atheists Anonymous. And yet he glorifies Jesus Christ. He praises Jesus Christ and he confesses Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. But he calls himself Atheists Anonymous. Well, I guess. Can you put it, please, on post on Patreon? Thank you, Magdalene. Tell me what to do. Hmm? Magdalene's the boss of me. That's no, all right. Yeah. That's all right. Come on, you, Magdalene. Am I buff enough and handsome enough? Talk to me. When someone beautiful says I'm beautiful, then that makes my day. But you got to be honest and tell me the truth. Talitha Pumi, good to see you again. And I'm assuming, see, Talitha Pumi is what the Lord Jesus Christ said to Jairus' daughter in Aramaic. Either, because I can't tell from your picture, it's very small. You're a sister in the Lord Jesus Christ or your brother. And I'm suspecting, are you a Syrian? Maybe not, because you got that from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. <clears throat> so Talitha Pumi, are you a brother or a sister and do you speak Assyrian? Don't put pressure on her, Carly Waller. I may not be, you know, up, up to her standards or taste of men, okay? Don't put, don't put pressure on her. Look at that, man. Look at that, man. I just got to start hitting weights again. Pray for me now that Jesus Christ will give me the grace to tighten up on my eating and increase my cardio. I've been neglecting it. Pray I don't gain weight, but lose it. Keep it off. Get healthy for his glory and be holy, even holier for the glory of Jesus because I'm not holy enough. <clears throat> no, the Assyrians are not the ancestors of the ancient Assyrians. The ancient Assyrians are the ancestors of Assyrians. We are descendants of the Assyrians. You got it the other way around. You get what I'm saying? Alvin Wright. Elder Wright, you still did not explain. Here's where you confuse me. Why did you make that comment about my daughters? Because from the comments I see, you're a Christian and you follow Jesus. Why did you make that comment? Because I saw you hitting on women and then you mentioned my daughters. I've been doing a lot of walking and hiking, Lion Bar. Well, I should say I'm starting to. Choose Jesus. That's how I lost weight. Intermittent fasting. Have you seen my before and after pictures? Don't hate Choose Jesus. I used to be 340. I'm down to around 240s, but I want to go down 220 because I still have love handles. That means I need to be skinnier. So I've been maintaining by the grace of God. But choose Jesus. You're always hating, man. 
You're always hating, man. I don't know. Thank you, Lindsay. See, Lindsay said, I'm beautiful. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Sajad, Lord Jesus willing, I will do a session on the Lord's Prayer. Only 80? You're a hater, bro. You haven't lost anything. Watch me, man. I'm going to beat you because I lost about 100. But I got to lose another 40. Please, Lord, help me. Help me not to stay here. Please, my God. Take me at higher levels. But more importantly, here's what I want you to pray. I want you to pray that Jesus Christ makes us holier to go to higher levels of holiness because we cannot love Jesus enough. Gloria, 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 I think they got your number. Gloria, I think they got your alias. Gloria, that you've been living under. Gloria, oh. By the way, pray, Gloria, by the grace of Jesus Christ, when COVID is over, I want to come to New York and spend some time. But do me a favor. If you know of any local brothers in Jesus or even couples that have an extra room that they wouldn't mind, let me stay there because we're in full-time ministry. We don't want to be going to hotels and wasting money. Jai, I look for you, man, on Discord, bro. To John, have you noticed how I can take the names of people and either remember songs with the names in it or turn a song about someone else, about the person, right? Like here, Gloria. How many of you guys remember that song, Gloria? What's up, Phantom? Gloria, Gloria, I think I've got your number. Gloria, I think they got your alias. Because I can't do that deep female voice. I'm trying to, right? And then they also have, there's no songs about Lindsay. Magdalene, there's no songs about her either, right? There are songs about... I had a girl, Donna was her name. Since she left me, things haven't been the same. Cause I love my girl, Donna, where can you be? Where can you be? Oh, you, you, anyone remember who sings that song? Hepsa, keep laughing. Yeah, we found out about you, Hepsa. Yeah, Carly Simon, you're so, is that the one who sings, you're so vain, you think the song's about you, don't you, you're so vain, you think the song's about you, don't you, don't you. Pray I, that I should go walk today. That's right, man. No matter what you, this one here, this bicep needs to, yeah, the Father, the Spirit, destroy the buffering in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. It's going to get better. Hold on. Right when I was about to post, do you believe it? Hold on. This bicep here needs a little more, you know, but here. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. And I don't even hit weights. You believe that? Thank you guys for the super chat. I got to go and collect it now. Thank you guys. God bless you. Sam, you never posted the link last night. Why don't you post that five more times? Link to what? Link to what? It's okay, Timothy. I can be vain and then repent later, but you'll still be ugly and you can't repent of it. <laughs> Radioactive. You want me to block you then? You don't like it, you need to leave. So radioactive, just tell me, one, you need to go, or two, you want to stay. I'm sorry I hurt your, your feelings, sweetie. Did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> yes, Verona, are you a Syrian? Hey, Verona, my sister, how you doing? Have you been starting to follow me? Have you now passed on these links to other Assyrians, Verona? We got a lot of Syrians here. Yeah. Praise the Lord Jesus. Tell them I've met this Assyrian guy, this big, bald Jilu. He's Jiluaya, big, bald Assyrian Jilu guy. He is so handsome, but he's preaching heresy left and right, right? No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. I love you, and I hate you, and I... Oh! All right.
Are we now ready to begin? Pedro, don't worry about it. Pedro, I don't want to mention names because people are going to say, what's up, first and last? You always be last in my book, and Pilesen will be first. That's right. Hit the like button. Okay? Magdalene, you didn't tell me I was gorgeous because I know you don't want to lie. So you're saying I'm not good looking according to your book. Huh? Is that what it is? Lindsay said I was, but Lindsay's just being nice. I don't want you guys to lie. All right? No matter what you do. All right. Yeah, I don't want to mention names. Forget about it because if I mention names, people are going to say that I'm not being Christ-like. Kevin Castro, why do you want to know if I was born into a Christian family? What is it? Jai is in the hizzy. Hey, Jai, I made you a uh, mod, right? Well, it's kind of too late. You guys didn't remind me, and I forgot. Okay? It doesn't help when you don't remind me right when I butt in. Okay. All right. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, Son of the Most High, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, we ask that you bless this session by purifying us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse us, Father. Wash us in the blood of Jesus and save us from our flesh. Save us from, <clears throat> from indulging the flesh and transform us by the power of the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus Christ. And Father, help us in those areas that we struggle with to overcome them. Whatever sinful, wicked passion we, we have, deliver us, Father, for the glory of Jesus and give us the power to exercise self-discipline, self-control, self-constraint, Father, to walk in the life of the Spirit, to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, and not to walk in the flesh. And, Father, you know the areas that I'm weak. Give me deliverance for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men, to become more like Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ, and to trust in Jesus Christ, and obey Jesus Christ more perfectly because we cannot love him enough, Father. And do forgive us, Lord, for our shortcomings. Forgive me for my moral failures today, Father. Please give me the grace not to justify them, but to turn away from them. And, Father, bless everyone here. Lord, fill them with, with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your spirit, and guide the conversation. Guide me to know what topics you want me to discuss to bless your people, your church, Father. Save me from error and stammering and confusion and enable me to recall the facts of Scripture and the passages of Scripture and interpret them perfectly by the power of your spirit so that every one of us will fall more in love with Jesus, fall more in love with your word, and give us the power to live your word, to obey your word, to proclaim your word without shame, without fear, without compromise, and even die for your word if that's necessary, Father. Father, destroy distractions of Satan. Keep us safe from the evil one. Keep our families safe from the evil one. And those who are not saved and our family members, grant them salvation to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters, my angels, and seal them by the Spirit and wash them blood of Jesus Christ and provide for them overabundantly for all of us in this time where the world is panicking and people are living by faith. Give us the grace to never doubt you, to never lose trust in you, never turn away from you, and never shame your name, but to endure by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. May he increase in us. May we decrease, Father. And bless this session. Anoint this session for your glory, Father, for the glory of Jesus, for the glory of your Holy Spirit. And help me be a blessing, not a stumbling block, Father, and purify our motives. We need you, Father. We love you. We need you, and we love you, Lord Jesus. We need you. We love you, Holy Spirit. Glorify Christ through me and beatify me and the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. And fill my chest and my lungs, my lungs and throat with the breath of life. Fill, fill me with the breath of life, Lord Jesus. Fill me, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus. Teach us how to pray, how to live for you, how to worship you, how to love you, how to... Holy Spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. May Jesus Christ increase in us. And Father, please destroy the buffering, we beg you. You don't need me. We need you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Guys, I'm sorry about that. The reason why I'm buffering is for some reason my live streams buffer, whereas when I'm doing Skype sessions, it doesn't buffer. Even though I'm on the modem, it's actually 99% better than what it used to be. Boy, it used to be a nightmare. But for some reason, it's still buffering.
So I apologize for that. There's nothing I can do. But glory to God, it stops buffering after a while. Right? Thank you, Sargon. He, it's buffering because I'm buffed. Yeah, baby. Come on now. I got to just shave. I just got to brush my teeth more. Because you know what? In Britain, they love yellow stained teeth. And I, you know how I know that? Because I got, I got that from Austin Powers. And Austin Powers doesn't lie. And Austin Powers, you saw that it was groovy, baby, to have yellow stained teeth. Yeah, baby. So I drink a lot of coffee, and unfortunately, I'm drinking diet soda. In Jesus' name, I'm going to try to give it up. That helps me to cure my appetite. Yeah, baby. Sure. Yeah, baby. There you are. You know me? No, it's you. You got to be there, right? All right. Sorry, you guys can see that I keep myself entertained by watching a lot of weird movies and listening to a lot of weird songs, right? And uh, I remember that one scene where he passes gas. Sorry, guys. They're like, man, this, what does this guy talk? Well, you know, we got to – sometimes we got to joke to lighten the atmosphere so that people don't feel stressed out, okay? So, you know, he passed gas, and she goes, how dare you go before me? He goes, I'm sorry, love. I didn't know you wanted to go first. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do that. If the Lord ever wants me to remarry, if he wants me to, if he wants me to be celibate, his will be done. May he just crucify my sinful passions, and I'm ready to be celibate for the glory of Jesus until he calls me home. But if he has someone for me, his will be done. But if I ever remarry, I'm going to do that because that would be a test if, of my wife's love to me. That's how I'm going to know she loves me, that when I do that, she'll just say, oh, it smells like cologne. Can you keep doing that? That's how you're going to, guys, that's how you know a woman is in love with you. When your gas smells like cologne to her. And women, that's how you know your husband loves you. When you pass gas and he says, oh, what wonderful parfum. The odor, the radiance is so nice, the parfum. <sighs> right? You know, you know, you know, ladies, right? That woman, that's the test. If you want to know, it's a sign of God that this man is from the Lord and God sent him to marry you and he'll be faithful through thick and thin. Pass a nasty gas. Eat some beans, right? And then when you pass gas, if he reacts, it says, oh, my darling, the odor is wunderbar. I've never smelled perfume like this. You just swept me off my feet. Marry me. All right. Are we ready now? Lord, bring them for your glory in Jesus' name. We had about 200. Lord's will be done. Okay. So let's continue the discussion. This is part two. God willing, I'll get into Being born again, maybe tomorrow or Monday. See, the women are all laughing. They're like, yes. The last time I did it, the guy took off, and I've never seen him since. And he even blocked me on Facebook and changed his number. See, that was a sign. It wasn't him. Okay. Now, with that said, Lord willing, I'll do another session on being born again, either tomorrow or Monday, if God wills. But I just felt that I wanted to talk about Jesus being worshipped in the Synoptic Gospels, specifically Matthew and Luke, because remember what the objection was. If you haven't listened to part one, I hope I don't confuse you, but I don't want to repeat things I've already established in the previous session. It's always important that if you see a session that says part two, listen to part one before you go to part two. Listen to part one and two before you go to part three. One of the objections that was raised in one of the live streams with David Wood, right? One of the objections that was raised in the live stream with David Wood and I was that Matthew 4.10, Jesus said, worship the Lord your God alone, and therefore Jesus is in God, so you Christians don't follow your NGO. If you Christians follow your NGO, then you won't worship Jesus, but you're going to worship the God of Jesus. So let, let's now deal with it. So I already laid the groundwork. So what am I going to uh, set out to prove? The same Jesus... In Matthew and Luke, the same Jesus in Matthew and Luke receives worship 
that belongs only to God. So what, what am I setting out to prove? What's my goal? Here's my goal. The same Lord Jesus Christ who said, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That same Jesus in Matthew, Luke, as well as Mark. But we're going to focus on Matthew, Luke and Acts because it's written by the same author. Receives worship that belongs to God alone. Thank you, Mendes. God bless you. Guys, are you still talking about gas? Dude, get off of it. That was 10 minutes ago. Don't use that test now to see if that person's going to marry you or not. Let's focus, man. For the, I'm like, yeah, we poop and hey, that's all right. <whistles> Guys, oh, sh sh Switzerland. So, you know, let's come back. <laughs> Dudes, you're still on it. One sister said, yeah, we poop too. Oh, I didn't know. I thought you women were like from Venus, right? You don't, nothing. Yeah. Anyway, let's focus. Okay. So now I'm going to set forth evidence from Matthew and Luke, as well as Acts, because Luke who wrote Luke wrote Acts, showing that Jesus receives the worship that belongs only to God because he's God. So we do agree. We are to worship the Lord, our God, and serve him only. But the Lord, our God, the Lord who is God, is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's why we're Trinitarians. Are you with me there? So let's discuss. We're going to continue from where I left off yesterday. We're going to continue where I left off from yesterday. So we were unpacking Matthew chapter 2, where there the Magi, the Magi, these wise men from the east, came to worship Jesus Christ because they knew that the time had come for the king of Israel to be born. And they found our Lord Jesus around the age of two, living in his home with his mother and his adoptive father, Joseph, in Bethlehem of Judea. And we unpacked the context to show that they were worshiping Jesus as the God-man. Go back to part one for the details. I also discussed other issues that I felt the Spirit leading me to discuss. So I'm not going to revisit all those points, but I do want to talk a little further about the prophecy that the Jewish scribes cited when Herod <clears throat> asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Herod was an Edomian. An Edomian is an Edomite. So he was an Edomite, a descendant of Esau, and he was ruling Jerusalem. When he saw the wise men, he was startled and troubled. And when they told him that they were here to worship the king of Israel, Herod took that as a threat to his throne and wanted to find the child to kill him. Right. So he asked the Jewish scribes, the scholars of the Hebrew Bible. Does the Hebrew Bible mention the birthplace of the Messiah? Now let's go to Matthew chapter two, verses five and six. See what they cite, because we're going to unpack it a little further, because I that's what I ended it with yesterday. That's what I ended it with yesterday. Matthew 2, verses 5 to 6. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written in the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Here they're quoting Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and combining it with 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 2. Now, before I move on, Protestant, what version are you quoting? What version are you quoting? New King James Version. Now, the New King James Version and the King James Version, and I believe the English Standard Version, perfectly translate the Hebrew of Micah 5, verse 2. Sadly, not all transla translations translate it correctly. For some reason, evangelical Trinitarian scholars decide to translate the Hebrew of Micah 5, 2, in a manner that robs the Lord Jesus Christ, that robs the Lord Jesus Christ of his eternal dignity and glory. And just to confirm, I believe the English Standard Version does get it right. But again, there's only so much I can remember. Can we look at Micah 5 verse 2 from the English Standard Version? No, the NIV butchers it, Alvin Wright. So I didn't hear what your response was to why you were hitting on my daughters. I hope it was innocent. You said you commented, but I didn't see it. But now that you like the NIV, you're scaring me. 
And again, 1611, if the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. Yeah, so the ESV does butcher it, doesn't it? Wow. Then what version was I reading? This is the English Standard Version. Thank the Lord that we're live because one of my prayers and my trust in the Holy Spirit will save me from error and correct me on the spot so I don't mislead you. Wow. Okay, do you see how English Standard Version rendered the last part? Who's going, who's coming forth is from old, from of old, from ancient days. No, that was terrible. No, that's why I'm confused. It's the New American Standard Bible that translates it perfectly. Forgive me because I get confused between English Standard Version and and New American Standard Bible. If there was a particular translation of what they call the ecletic text, and I don't have time to unpack this, because there are two textual streams. There is the stream in which scholars view as being vastly superior and more accurate to the originals. And again, they would call this, this, this type of, how do I say this? Because even though now, even the classification of manuscripts is going to be obsolete, they're going to change the way they classify manuscripts. There is a group of scholars that believe in what's known as reason eclecticism, where you prioritize the earliest Greek copies, witnesses of the New Testament, specifically the Alexandrian stream, Right, the readings that agree with the manuscripts produced in Alexandria, Egypt. Right, so you prioritize them because they believe they are more accurate and closer to the originals. Right, and they call that reason eclecticism. So you have many versions that are based on that theory. New American Standard Bible would be one of those. New American Standard Bible would be based on that stream of manuscripts and that view of textual criticism and translation. If you prefer that stream, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me and save me from error, if you prefer that stream, you believe that the earliest copies, the papyri, are closer to the originals and are vastly superior, or the Alexandrian stream, the manuscripts produced in Alexandria, Egypt, are superior and closer to the originals, then the Bible translation that you should use and follow would be the New American Standard Bible. To me, that is the best translation from that particular understanding and stream. However, if you believe in the received text, Textus Receptus, or what's known as the majority text, the Byzantine tradition, because they form the majority of Greek witnesses, and they have a higher degree of agreement. And the Byzantine tradition was pretty much that line of textual transmission that the church had access to, then you would go with New King James Version, Modern English Version, or if you believe in the received text, Textus Receptus, which is a subset of the majority text, the Byzantine tradition, then you stick with the King James. And again, just to be transparent, just to be transparent, I have come to the conviction and believe the King James Bible is the best English translation. It is the translation of God's pure words in English preserved by God and made the standard and the king of all translations. That's my position, my belief. I know there are objections against what I believe and I can't answer them. But like any position, any position has objections that you can't thoroughly or adequately address. This is my conviction, my belief, that the King James translation is God's preserved words in English based on those manuscripts that God in his sovereignty guided his church to use. And it wasn't just Greek. They also looked into various versions like the Latin version, right, to give us what God wanted for English speakers his perfect words in English. That's my conviction. That's my belief. Okay. Now, if you don't believe that, but you believe that the earlier witnesses need to be <clears throat> examined, need to be consulted, and therefore the earlier witnesses are more closer to the originals and 
therefore more accurate, specifically the Alexandrian stream, even though this classification, from what I've been told in the field, is going to be obsolete. They won't be classifying it as Alexandrian or Westerns, et cetera, et cetera. Not trying to confuse you, but follow with me. If that's what you believe, then from that stream and from that particular view of textual criticism, in my estimation, the best representative and the most accurate translation of that stream is the New American Standard Bible. Are you with me there? Did I confuse you guys and did I bore you guys and I torture you guys and did I waste your time? I hope not. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to anoint me to speak clearly and save me from error for the glory of Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit, take over. I need you because I am not qualified to talk about these issues. You are the one who qualifies us for the glory of Jesus. And we trust in you and we believe in you and we know you live, Holy Spirit. And you live in us for the glory of Jesus. Okay, now why did I spend 10 minutes ranting on this issue? And why did I say if you believe in that stream, the Alexandrian stream, or what's known as reason eclecticism, where you take into view the earliest papyrus that start that were discovered in the 19th century and 20th century. Some of these manuscripts, these papyrus, date back to the second century, third century, fourth century. If you believe those manuscripts are superior and need to be prioritized then you should go with the New American Standard Bible. Now, why? Because here, let me show you how the New American Standard Bible translates Micah 5, verse 2. Pedro Jr., any English translation done by evangelical Christians will give you the same gospel, the same God, the same Jesus, the same spirit, the same message. Okay? Now, notice how... The New American Standard Bible translates Micah 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From, one, from you, one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Perfect translation of the Hebrew. That's New American Standard Bible. Did you catch it? Post it one more time. I'm going to use Micah 5.2 to show you why I said the New American Standard Bible is the best translation of that particular view of textual criticism. Because notice it again. Let's read. Read with me. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephratha, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from, of, from long ago, from days of eternity. Perfect translation of the Hebrew, and it virtually agrees with the King James Version. Let's quote Micah 5.2 in the King James Version. There's a lot of dead languages that you need to study in order to understand. Okay, now notice this King James. But thou Bethlehem Ephra, Ephrata, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That's exactly how the New American Standard Bible reads. There's only one difference. When you read the King James says from everlasting, whereas the New American Standard Bible says from days of eternity. Right? But both translations perfectly capture the Hebrew. Now, someone keeps asking me about the NIV. There are certain places which the NIV gives you an excellent meaning of what the original languages are saying. But NIV, in my estimation, is one of the worst out there. Not necessarily Ariel Gonzalez. No, not necessarily. Because we don't have as many... Copies of the Hebrew Bible as we do for the New Testament, right? So pretty much they'll be translating, for the most part, the same form of the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. The disagreements center around the New Testament. Okay, now 
Why do I say that NIV is, in my estimation, the worst? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm a scholar and I'm on the level of these men. I'm not. I can't hold a candlestick to these men who are scholars in the field. But what I do is I study and examine various opinions and I compare translations. And here again, why I really like the, dislike the NIV, even though it has some good points to it, and in some places does an excellent job of giving you what a passage means. But to be honest, it is a translation that gets me upset. The more I study this issue and the more I learn from these scholars, the more this translation upsets me, especially the 2011 edition, especially that. Let me show you what do I mean. Look at how the NIV renders Micah 5 verse 2 at least how the 1984 edition renders it. And I believe the 2011 update is the same. But let's look at it in the update, 2011. Let's see if they've changed it. Micah 5, verse 2. Let me show you why I say this is perhaps the worst. There you go. You see how I've translated the Micah 5, 2, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. This actually can be used to support that Jesus is created. See, he had an origin, and he originated from old, from ancient times, but he's not eternal. Do you see why I said this translation at times is pathetic and pathetically bad? You see that? Post it again, Micah 5, 2. Oh, this is Wagu again, Phantom? See, Phantom, when you say Twagu, that means you're being satisfied by the glory of Jesus Christ. Look at the NIV, guys, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. If someone doesn't know better, they would think that here it's saying this ruler was created. He has an origin. So he's brought into being long ago, but he's not eternal. Right? You see the problem? And sadly, many translations read this way. Look at the Christian Standard Bible. Holman Christian Standard Bible, they updated it. And now and it's now called Christian Standard Bible. Post that. Christian Standard Bible. Watch here. Watch here. Christian Standard Bible, CSB. Watch here. Thank the mods for helping me to help you and serving me to serve you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you, guys. And thank you for your love and support. Watch. And then we're going to show you how the Jehovah Witness Bible renders Micah 5 verse 2. It's all right. I'm holding on, bro. That's to see. Great minds think like Riaz. But the sad thing is you're not a great mind, but you still think like me. I wonder what the New World Translation says. Thank you, Lisa. Lord bless you. Watch here. Luis and everyone else, you're following me? Okay. Here you go. Bethlehem Ephratha. Ephratha. This is Christian Standard Bible. You are small among the clans of Judah. One will come for you. To be ruler over Israel from for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. Tell me this is not a pathetically bad translation. A Trinitarian evangelical translation renders the Hebrew to imply that this ruler has an origin that's ancient. You caught it there? Now let me show you the Jehovah Witness Bible. That's why you have to be familiar with the versions in order to know what version to quote and what version not to quote. And you, O Bethlehem, this is the Jehovah Witness Bible, Ephrathah, the one too little to get to be among the thousands of Judah. From you there will come out to me the one who is to become ruler in Israel, whose origin is from early times, from the time, the days of time indefinite. Now, are you shocked that the Joe's Witnesses would render the Hebrew this way? 
Hayden, ESV is also bad here as well. Let, let me show you how the ESV renders it. ESV, Hayden. But sh doesn't it shock you that Trinitarian evangelical scholars render the Hebrew similarly to the way the Jehovah's Witnesses render Micah 5 verse 2? Here's your ESV, Hayden. Right? Whose coming forth is from old, from of old, from ancient days. Now here it's not as bad because coming forth may not be the same as origin. But if I say I came forth from my mother's belly in 1972, it still speaks of an origin in time, right? So it's not as bad, but it's not good either, ESV. See? Ed came forth out of his mother at this time. You see the point? Okay. I had to show you this to let you know, King James Version perfectly renders the Hebrew. New King James Version as well, and New American Standard Bible. No, there is no eternal generation there, Travis, because the word eternal is not there. How are you going to get eternal generation when you don't use the word eternal or everlasting? You get my point? Yep. I can't comment on the CAV first and last, but there's a reason why they rendered it that way. No, but Travis, you 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 still don't get it. The eternal generation means he came forth from eternity. What in that passage says he came forth from eternity? Where do you get eternal generation from? He came forth from old, from ancient times. They have their reasons to justify George Wagner, but I don't have time to unpack those reasons. I've heard them, and believe me when I say it, it's pathetic. It's simply liberal scholarship poisoning our conservative scholars. It is, again, conservative evangelical scholars wanting to appease liberal scholarship and concede many liberal points in order to get the respect of academia. Honestly, that's what it is. I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating. That's what it is. Lord willing, I may give you the reason in another session or maybe later, later on, but I can't do it now. Trust me when I say, trust me when I say, it's because they've, they've imbibed too much of the liberal Kool-Aid. And they want the respect of their liberal peers and liberal academia so that they can be considered serious scholars. But the love of the world is enmity towards God. James chapter 4 verse 4. I could give a damn whether a liberal scholar respects me or not. Right? So they don't want to translate Micah 5.2. In such a way to make it affirm the eternal pre-human existence of the Messiah. Because the liberals say, oh, come on. Do you really think Micah knew that the ruler was an eternal being, God in the flesh? Are you serious? Are you going to read your fundamental, fanatical Christian views into the Hebrew Bible? Is that serious scholarship? See, that's what it is. Seriously, that's what it is. I'm not lying to you. Because liberals do not believe in predictive prophecy, nor do they believe that God revealed to the prophets that Messiah would be God in the flesh, an eternal person who becomes human. Do you really think the Old Testament prophets knew all that? you really think David knew that, he, that Messiah is his Lord who sits at God's right hand? Guys, give it up. David didn't even write Psalm 110. you really think Isaiah 9? Is the prophecy of a child who's God Almighty in the flesh? That's the problem. That's the problem, guys. You understand? So isn't it sad and heartbreaking that our conservative evangelical scholars are conceding to liberalism and sounding more liberal as each day passes by with each passing day because they want the love of their liberal peers? Why? Your liberal peers don't believe God exists, and if they do, they don't believe that this God gets actively involved to the extent, extent of inspiring people to record his words and enable them to know the future before it happens because they're either deists, 
not theists. Why do you care whether they respect you or not? Why would you try to appease them? Why don't you appease your Lord and honor your Lord and love your Lord and glorify your Lord and say, yes, this is what the Hebrew says. There's no reason to translate the Hebrew words any other way. Maybe this word can mean ancient in another context, but not here. You with me there? That's exactly why they do what they do. It's sad, folks. This is why glorify the triune God with me. Let us praise the triune God. Let us praise the Father, Son, Holy Spirit that he has saved us from being in awe of scholarship. I'm not saying we can't learn stuff from conservative scholars. We can. They have a lot of good things and truths that God reveals through them to us. But we don't make them more than they are. And if they say something that we know doesn't sound right, you know what? You can keep your opinion. You're not inspired. I don't care if the entire scholarly guild says this is it. As for me and my whole soul, we will serve the Lord. Let God be true and every man a liar. Seriously. I have benefited from my conservative brothers and sisters. I have learned from them. But glory to God, glory to the trying God, he saved me from blindly following every word as if it's the gospel truth and making them more than they are, which is why I can say, okay, I agree with that, but here he's wrong. And that's not because I'm the standard. It's just because I'm aware of their need to appease liberal academia, which is why we're even having a debate whether a, an historical Adam and Eve exists. You got Christians who will now deny that Genesis is referring to an actual historical Adam and Eve. Why? Because they want to appease the scientific community who does not believe that a special creation of Adam and Eve ever occurred in the evolutionary cycle. So we want to their respect. We don't want to sound like stupid, crazed fanatics, right? You with me there? Who would have thought that the day would come where Christians who love the Bible would even have a debate whether Adam and Eve existed or not and try to find ways around having to affirm an historical Adam and Eve or try to posit an Adam and Eve somewhere around the evolutionary scheme where you have homo sapiens and homo, whatever you know, to make Christianity compatible with scientific theories held by men who could care less about your God and your Bible. Oh yeah, Hayden. I'm listening to a series by uh, listening to a series by William Lane Craig where he's talking about the historical Adam and Eve. You can go on Reasonable Faith on YouTube, listen to a series. Now he believes that the scientific data does point to an historical Adam and Eve, but the way he explains it He's trying to marry both the views of evolutionary scientists who don't believe in God and his belief that the Bible does conclusively prove an Adam and Eve did exist. And he's trying to marry the two in such a way to make it sensible and reasonable, both for the scientific community who doesn't believe in God and Christians who do. You with me there? So I am thankful at least William Lane Craig is saying there is solid scientific evidence for an Adam and Eve, and he hasn't dehistoricized Adam and Eve. Praise God. I was scared. I, honestly, when I was listening, I was scared. I'll be honest. I'm starting to get I go, oh, is he going to dehistoricize Adam and Eve? No, but the way he tries to marry belief in historical Adam and Eve with the scientific community, it's going to leave some of you, if not many of you, quite upset. Right? Quite upset. So here's where I stand. As long as you affirm an actual historical Adam and Eve, right, that were created with souls, not just with bodies, 
and that they did sin and mess things up, however you want to then harmonize that with science, to me, this is me, I'll accept you as a brother and sister in Christ, though we may disagree with wanting to somehow force these scientific views, which you take to be facts, to agree with the biblical narrative or vice versa. Yeah, he did. He, he, he thinks young earth creationism is a joke, Hayden. Dr. William Lane Craig thinks it's a silly, silly position and it's anti-intellectual. Well, say that to all these geniuses, these amazing Christian geniuses, right, who are young earth creationists and serious scientists who do engage the scientific community and are well conversant with the scientific data. They're not jokes. And I'm not talking about Ken Hovind. Not putting him down yet. Jason Lyle. And there's another brother who's amazing. They say he's also a master at chess. David Wood says he's a genius. I keep forgetting that brother's name. Does anyone know who I'm talking about? He's also a master chess player, and he is a genius. Yep, Jonathan Sarf Sarfati. Jonathan Sarfati and Jason Lyle. These guys are not jokes. They are serious scientists well conversant with the scientific data and are Christian geniuses and they're still young earth creationists. Are you going to laugh at them too? Yeah, but Greg Bonson wasn't a scientist. I'm talking about serious. These guys are scientists. They engage the scientific community and are well conversant in the scientific data and they're geniuses. Jonathan Sarvati. He's got a website, YouTube channel. Listen to this guy. He's a genius. And he's also a master chess player from what David Wood tells me. And Jason Lyle. These guys are not jokes. Do you want me there? Now, again, this is not a rant that I intended. But as long as the Holy Spirit guides me and uses me to speak what the Spirit wants me to speak, you'll be blessed and challenged and strengthened and fall more in love with Jesus if it's from the Holy Spirit. Okay, now. Why did I say this? Because you wanted to know why some Bible translations translate Micah 5 to in such a, a horrific way. Such a horrific way, right? As to rob Jesus of his eternal glory and dignity, even though that wasn't their intention. Because Micah 5 2 is a clear Old Testament prophecy, a prophecy made over 500 years before the birth of Christ. That the ruler of Israel will be born in Bethlehem and he's eternal because he's from eternity. Can I share with you a story that recently took place? There was a conference here. Al Fadi and I and Vocab were at the conference. They had a local conference at Phoenix Seminary on the Bible as God's Word, where they brought in Old Testament scholars and Daniel Wallace to talk about the accurate transmission of the Old and New Testaments. One of the scholars wrote a book on Micah, and he was defending the historical accuracy and preservation of the Old Testament. I asked him a question. I asked him, you guys ready for this? You ready for this? It was about Micah 5 verse 2. I forgot what his name is. I forgot what his name is. So I asked him, I go, how did you render Micah 5 2? In Micah 5 2, some translations render as whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He goes, that's how I translated it. He told me, that's how I translated it. Now remember, he's a Trinitarian evangelical scholar of the Old Testament. And he says that in his commentary, Micah 5, verse 2, he translated as whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Okay, now you know what I asked him? Now remember, folks, he's a scholar of Hebrew. He's a scholar of Hebrew. I said, can I ask you a question? He goes, yeah. How could you translate it this way? When the word, the Hebrew word that you translated as origins is plural. If it's talking about his ancestry, why does it say origins? Why didn't it say origin singular? Because the Hebrew, it's plural. 
It's plural. It's not origins. It's goings forth. It's plural. You know what he did? I'm not lying to you. Remember, he's a scholar of Hebrew. He paused. He goes, that's a good question. I didn't think about that. Wait, 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 wait. You're translating Micah 5 2 from Hebrew, and you read Hebrew, and you never thought about why it's plural? That was his answer. The Lord bears witness of I'm lying. He goes, maybe it's a plural of majesty. <laughs> maybe it's a plural of majesty. Everything's plural of majesty. <laughs> okay. So you understand? Their learning has made them stupid. Their learning has made them stupid. You read the Hebrew. You translate it from the Hebrew, and you never thought, why is it plural if it's re referring to his ancestral origin from David? Are you serious? These are our scholars, folks. You get it now? Is it making sense? So with all that said, let's go back. Let's now look at, thank you, Lindsay. God bless you, sister. Let's go back, look at Micah 5, verse 2 in the King James and New American Standard Bible. Here is the most accurate translation of the Hebrew, and then we're going to unpack it further, okay? Folks, if you keep praying for me that God keeps me healthy and makes me pure and holy to be a doer in love with Jesus and provide financially and save me financially from this corrupt legal system to deal with them and remove them and protect my children— I will teach you all this stuff for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the time we're done in these sessions, every one of you will be a Bible scholar in his or her own right. But my goal is not just to make you a Bible scholar. My goal is to be used with the Holy Spirit to, to make you scholars who are in love with Jesus, sold out for Jesus, who live for Jesus, and are willing to die for Jesus. That's what I want to see. Okay. Okay, Micah 5.2, King James, New American Standard Bible, back to back. He's infinitely beautiful. Let's post it. Let's, again, get the translation. Here it is, King James. Let's read now. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Now notice how it translated it perfectly. Perfectly. Whose goings forth, not origin, whose goings forth, and I'm going to tell you why that's important. Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now notice the New American Standard Bible. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Ephratha, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth. Fourth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Beautiful, perfect translation of the Hebrew. Do you see it rendered in? Goings forth. That's how it should be translated. His goings forth are from of old, and he's from the days of eternity. So let me tell you what Micah is saying. He's from eternity. He's eternal. And his activities, he's been active from the beginning. So let me explain what Micah 5.2 is saying. Are you ready now for the explanation? I'm going to give you a link to prove my point. Are you ready? Are you ready now to see what Micah is actually saying? Let me know if you're ready. Okay. Here's what his goings forth, plural, means. It means this being... Is from eternity. He's eternal. And this being has been active from the very start. He's been active. He's been showing up, doing things from the beginning because he's from eternity. Being eternal, he's been there from the beginning. And his activities, his goings forth, have been from the beginning because he's been quite active. In other words, what it's saying about this king is that he's not someone who shows up for the first time when he's born from his mother. He's been there from the beginning. He's been showing up from the beginning. He's been doing stuff from the beginning, and he's been doing stuff 
repetitively and repeatedly. Why? Because he's from eternity. And being from eternity, he was there from the beginning. He was active from the beginning. And he's been quite active ever since. That's what Micah 5.2 is saying. You understand now what it's saying? You understand what it's saying? Because now I'm going to give you the link to the interlinear of the Hebrew. Because I'm going to show you how this connects with the Garden of Eden. Okay. Let me give you this link. Don't take my word for it. Here's the link. Click on it. Look at what the word goings forth means. You'll see it will tell you it's plural. Okay. It's plural. Whose goings forth, if you look at it, you'll see it says <clears throat> FPC. The P is plural. Okay. So it's plural. No doubt about it. But then I want you to see the word from of old. Mikaddim. Mikaddim. I kept saying Qaddim yesterday because the Arabic cognate, the Arabic equivalent of the word Qaddim is Qaddim. So those of you who know Arabic, the Hebrew word Qaddim is Qaddim in Arabic because Hebrew and Arabic are sister languages. So do you see it's Mikaddim? So his activities have been from Qaddim. Mikaddim. From old, right? You guys see that? God bless you, Phantom. Thank you, brother. Do you see that? Let me give you the link again. Are you guys ready to get blown away? Because I'm going to show you why he used this term. Micah wants to show you that this one was there in the Garden of Eden. His activities go back to the Garden of Eden because he's eternal and was there in the Garden of Eden. Okay. You don't believe me? Okay, now what, what, here's what I want you to do. Click on the word Miqaddim, and guess what you find? Guess what you find? Click there, and you'll see the word Miqaddim is used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, and Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. It is the word translated the east. This is referring to the garden being placed in the east of Eden. Do you catch it? Mithedim is the Hebrew word used for the location of the garden. The garden was Mithedim, Eden. It was in the east of Eden. Who's not getting it? Make the connection. He's from Mithedim. That word is used for the garden that was placed in Kaddim, Eden, in the east of Eden. Connect. Oh, wait. He's been active from the beginning. His activities go way back to the beginning. The beginning of what? When man was created to dwell in the Garden of Eden. You catch it now? The ruler of Israel isn't a recent human figure who comes into being when his mother conceives and gives birth to him. The ruler of Israel is eternal. He's from eternity. And because he's eternal, he's been active from the beginning. He was active in the garden, appearing to Adam and Eve, and he's been active ever since. And eventually he's going to be born of a woman to become a human ruler of Israel. That's what Micah 5.2 is telling you. He is the one who was walking in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned, and he told them, Adam, where are you? Why are you hiding from me? The voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the, of the day. Right? Did it sink in, what I'm trying to show you? Who didn't get it? Whose goings forth activities have been from old. And his days are from eternity because he's eternal. 
So the Eternal One has been active from the beginning. He was there actively involved with Adam and Eve in the garden. So his activity started in actually in creation. But he got personally involved from the beginning when Adam and Eve was in the garden. And he's been actively involved ever since. That's what you just read. Hit that like button. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Here's the link again. So understand what a glorious prophecy Micah 5, verse 2 is. What a glorious prophecy. A prophecy over 500 years before the birth of Jesus that says Israel's ruler will come from Bethlehem of Judea. But he is an eternal being, an eternal person who comes from eternity to become a flesh and blood human being through his mother who gives birth to him. And because he's eternal, he's been active from the beginning of creation and will continue to be active to the very end when he returns in glory as the God man, Jesus of Nazareth. No, I've already done Melchizedek. Melchizedek is not Jesus, Paul R. Go back and watch my sessions on it and my article on it. You see why it's a travesty to then mistranslate the Hebrew and rob it of its power and significance and impact and affirming that Israel's ruler is the God-man, the eternal God who enters time and space to become man from a woman who conceives and gives birth to him in labor pains. That's Micah 5, verses 2 and 4. And because he's God, he's been actively involved in the salvation and redemption of humanity from the time of the garden. So let's go back and see if Jesus fulfilled it. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. No, Sonny, I can't literally tell you. And change topics. Go listen to my sessions. If you're new here, subscribe. Hit the like button. I already talked about the garden in previous sessions. Okay. Where was Jesus born? Matthew 2, 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, let's read verses 5 and 6 again. 5 and 6 again. So they said to him, Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now notice what they said. When Herod says, where the Messiah will be born, they go, Bethlehem. Why? Micah 5, 2. So here you have Matthew as a first century witness that the Jews during Jesus' time understood Micah 5, 2 to refer to the birthplace of the Messiah. And where was Jesus born? Exactly where Micah said he'd be born. Bethlehem of Judea. But here's what's interesting. If Jesus is that ruler who would be born in Bethlehem, then Jesus is the eternal one becoming flesh. He is the God-man, God who became man, because according to Micah 5 verse 2, that human ruler is from eternity, and he's been quite active from the very beginning affirming two facts. Number one, Jesus is eternal. He's not a creature. He's the eternal one, God, who becomes born as a man to be Israel's ruler. And number two, Jesus has been active all throughout Old Testament history. That's what Micah 5 verse 2 is proving. Right? So when they come to worship him, Matthew 2 verse 11, are they simply giving him honor as a human ruler or worshiping him as the God-man? Matthew 2, verse 11. Now, let me check something real quick. Check something. Let's go to Matthew 2, 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Were they honoring him simply as a king or worshiping him as the God-man 
the divine one who became Israel's human ruler. Now go back for all the details, because I already unpacked Matthew chapter 2 in yesterday's session in part 1. So you got to go back and listen to part 1, because I gave multiple lines of evidence showing they were worshiping him, not just giving him honor as a human king, but worshiping him as God who became flesh, the divine human one, Israel's God who becomes Israel's king by being born as a human babe, from his virgin mother by the power of the Holy Spirit in order to be the human heir of David's throne. I gave additional details yesterday. But another line of evidence, and this is implicit, not explicit. I gave you explicit, explicit proof yesterday and right now, but I'm going to give you another line of evidence that's implicit. If they were simply honoring him and not worshiping him as God, then we would expect them to, to give honor to his mother and him, honoring her for giving birth to him if it was merely honor and not worship given to God. But notice it says they worshiped him and him alone. Why? Because though they knew this is his mother, she's still human and not worthy of divine worship. Matthew 2.11 but if it's simply honor, then they would honor her being the mother of the king. But if it's not mere honor, but worship as God, then they know we can worship him, not her. You with me there? You with me there? Now, let me just check something real quickly. Let me check something real quickly. Yep, right here. Before I say something, because I don't want to just go by memory. Memory stuck between the pages of my mind. Let me see something. Let me see. Oh, yep. Here you go, guys. Here you go. Here is an online Jewish website, Orthodox Jews, that provide an English translation of the Tanakh with the commentaries of one of the greatest medieval rabbis who ever lived, Rashi. Here it is, guys. I don't want to speak from memory, but here you go. Dr. Dre Easy, here you go. Guys, can you blow me away and blow yourselves away by clicking on it? Because Rashi, who is an anti-Christian rabbi, Writing in the medieval period admits that Micah 5 2 is about Messiah. Here you go. I gave you the link. Let me give you the quote. Did you catch it? Here's the quote From you shall emerge from him the Messiah, son of David. And did you see how he then applies Psalm 118.22 to Messiah? This is the very verse Jesus quotes and the apostles quotes in reference to the Jews rejecting him. And so scripture says the stone the builders had rejected became a cornerstone. Why is Rashi admitting Psalm 118 verse 22 and Micah 5 verse 2 is about Messiah when Jesus and the New Testament writers say Micah 5 2 and Psalm 118 22 is about Messiah who is Jesus? Why is he confirming the New Testament interpretation? You catch it? Thank you, Rashi. And he was no friend of Christianity. Here's the link again. Chabad.org. Guys, doesn't it blow you away that even a medieval rabbi who was combating Christianity, and new Christians were quoting these texts, Micah 5, verse 2, and Psalm 118, 22, about Jesus the Messiah, knowing that he still has to admit, yeah, Micah is about Messiah, that he'll be born there, and Psalm 118, about the stone that the builders rejected, is about Messiah. Little did he realize he's one of those builders because he was rejecting his Messiah, Jesus. Bob, can you wait till tomorrow when we're going to address Adnan's claims? 
Lord Jesus willing, we're going to do a part two to his claims tomorrow. Who's not blown away by this? Right? Is our Bible amazing or what? What more proofs do we need? The God of the Bible is real and the Bible is his word. And Jesus is the God man, the Messiah of Israel. Right? Because Sargon, they don't believe the New Testament is accurate. So they'll say, well, no, they lied and they placed Jesus in Bethlehem. Right? That's how they get around it. Right? Matthew made it up. Luke made it up. Yeah, I know. Isn't that amazing? I like that comment. Rashi is more Christian than liberal scholars. Faith love? Absolutely. Do you see what faith love said? A medieval rabbi who hated Christianity and opposed it admits Micah 5 2 and Psalm 18 22 is about Messiah. Liberal scholars will say, no, it's not. Micah wasn't speaking of the Messiah. And Psalm 118, 118 22 is not about Messiah. So liberal scholars know more than the New Testament authors, than Jesus and his followers, and even rabbis who should have denied this is about Messiah in reaction to Christianity. Rashi should have said, no, 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 Micah has nothing to do about Messiah. But he couldn't. He still had to admit it's about Messiah. Right? Doesn't this make you stand more in awe of how real Jesus is, that he is alive, he is almighty, and the spirit is alive, and he's alive in us, and the Bible says we're like, wow, how amazing and how real you are, and how much you love us to give us assurance. You live, and that if we trust in you, we will never perish. Amazing, isn't it? So with that said, I've unpacked Matthew 2. Let's look at other places where Jesus is worshipped as God. Jesus is worshipped as God. The cure for liberalism is affirm the historical accuracy, inspiration of the Bible, keep preaching it, and pray, and ask the Spirit to fill you, and that's how you're going to destroy liberalism. Why do you think nobody's slave? When a church becomes liberal, it becomes dead, it becomes empty, waiting for the Muslims to convert it into a mosque. Because there's no life in liberalism. But when you have a church that believes the Bible is living and active and it's the word of God and believes the Holy Spirit is living and active in us and preaches the word without compromise, they fill that church to the rafters. Right? Because liberalism cannot assuage a heart created to know the creator and to be satisfied in him. It can't. So you're going to have to look for it elsewhere. This is why this is a fact. This is not my opinion. Although Europe turned its back on God, it didn't turn its back on the supernatural. You will have people telling you who live in Europe, especially France, that the rise of the occult and witchcraft, witchcraft, the occult and the cult have risen like never before. It's on the rise. Why? Because the heart of a person has to be filled with something. Even though your heart is created to be filled with God, if you're not filling it with God, you got to fill it with something. So though people may have turned their backs on Christianity in the Bible, they have not turned their backs on spirituality. So that's why you're going to find a rise in witchcraft, more witches than ever before. Pagans who are openly pagans worshiping the earth. The occult is on the rise in Europe. It's a fact. I'm not lying. You guys in Europe, especially in France, am I lying? It's on the rise. You get my point? It's on the rise. Why? Because God is real. Satan is real. And God created your heart to only be at rest in him. And if you don't believe in him, then your heart remains restless until you find something to give you rest. But that's a satanic deception. 
Satan will give you something to give you the appearance that you found what you're looking for, but at the end, it destroys you and cannot give you lasting satisfaction. Whereas, look at us. Look at David Wood. Look at me. We can be going through hell like I am with my daughters and their immoral mother and a corrupt judge after me for 50000 that I did not accrue, but she did and wants to throw me in jail. And yet, because of Jesus, we're still completely at ease, at peace, as rest, and satisfied. Because Jesus is alive, and he cannot lie. And he said, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives it to you, but in me you'll have peace. Right? Clear? Glory to God, may you stay away from Islam. So you see the point? So the cure to liberalism, our Christians sold out for the Bible, believing it is the word of God, trusting it's been preserved, it's God's voice, and loving and worshiping the God who speaks in that Bible and proclaiming it. And you're going to see people on fire for the Lord, sold out for the Lord, if you preach the truth of the message. Look, look at you guys. You're proof of it. Look, we have 176. And you guys are on fire for the Lord and hungry for the Lord and aching for the Lord and love the Lord and want him more. Lord, more, more, more. Right? And there are many out there like you that want to hear this. And I'm sure many of you will tell me that I was looking for in the Bible study. I was looking for me. I wanted to know the depth of God's word. And I went to these churches. I couldn't find it. And finally, I found it. And now I'm ignited for the Lord. I'm on fire for the Lord. I'm in love with the Lord. And I cannot live without the Lord. Right? Right? And there are many like you out there. And so what did God do? He honored your desire and yearning. Because what did Jesus say? Ask. And what will happen? Ask. Come on, guys, finish it. Ask and you will. Seek and you will. Knock and you will. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. And knock and it should be open to you. And you know what he's talking about? The gift of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But if you actually read it, it means keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and don't stop until God answers. Because God is using that to discipline you, to train you, to endure and persist, to exercise your spiritual muscles. It's not that God doesn't want to give it to you right away. What God is doing is he's training you to keep exercising your spiritual muscles and not get lazy. It's his way of disciplining you for spiritual exercise and spiritual battle. And he goes, now here's your reward. Eat, feast at my table, feast upon my word, because I will bring the right teachers to feed you for the glory of Jesus. So you got it now. Now that said, let's look at another place where Jesus is said to be God who's worshiped as such. He's worshipped as God. Are you ready? You guys ready? There is no evidence that you're human. The evidence shows that you're a barking dog, a rabid dog like your mother. Okay? So, sorry about that. So, this guy doesn't seek. So, just want to know. He proves to me that even dogs can give birth to talking dogs. Now, with that said, let's first look at Psalm 8, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to show you something. Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. To the chief musician on the instrument of God, a psalm of David, O Yehovah, Jehovah, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Now pay attention to two, guys. Pay attention to two. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. 
because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Now, let me unpack Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. What is the psalmist saying? What is David saying? Because God's enemies refuse to worship him and glorify him, God will ordain, ordain babes and infants to ascribe strength to him, meaning to praise him, to silence his enemies. Guys, understand what you just read. David is saying, you know how God is going to embarrass his enemies? He's going to take infants and babes who don't know any better, and he's going to move them to praise him, to ordain strength. In other words, ascribe strength to him to show that even these babes have enough common sense to know I am God and worthy of their worship, unlike you, my enemies, who oppose me to your destruction. You understand what the psalmist is saying? Amen. May that fire increase in all of us, Irene. You understand what the psalmist is saying? He's saying, let me repeat it again. He's saying, I'm going to ordain infants and babes to ascribe strength to me, meaning to praise me, to show you that even they have enough common sense to recognize that I am God and worthy of worship, unlike you, my enemies, who in your sin and hatred refuse to worship me. Okay? Did you get that? And if you have any doubt, it's God, Psalm, 1, Psalm 8, verse 1. It says, Jehovah, our Lord. So is this referring to Jehovah being praised by infants and babes or a creature? Is Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2, referring to Jehovah God being praised by infants and babes or a creature? Who's being praised here? A creature or God Almighty? Jehovah Almighty. Jehovah, right? Yahweh, right? Who are the infants and babes praising? A creature or Jehovah? Jehovah, Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. Jehovah, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Okay, because guys, here's where I'm going to get confused. Here's where I'm going to get confused. I'm going to need your help. Matthew 21, 15 to 16. Matthew 21, verses 15 to 16. Help me out, guys. Pedro, Luisa, Magdalene, Lindsay, all of you. Sai Christian, all of you. Help me understand what we're about to read. Matthew 21, 15 and 16. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant, they were angry, and said to him, Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. <whistles> Jesus, what did you just do? Jesus, you quoted Psalm 8, verse 2, where children would praise Jehovah to embarrass his enemies, to justify the children praising you in front of your enemies. Whoa. Whoa. Jesus says to his enemies, why are you shocked? Don't you know that you should expect children to praise Jehovah when Jehovah's in their midst? Yeah, but they're praising you. Yeah, they're praising me. But the psalmist is about infants and babes praising Jehovah to embarrass his enemies. Yeah, and you're my enemies, and they're praising me. Make the connection. You understand? I'm smiling. How Jesus just showed that he showed he's Jehovah God. Isn't it amazing? It's like smiling from joy. That's why the Jews got angry, Pedro, because they realized, hey, this is worship that's to be given to God. You're a Jew. Silence them. You're a Jew. Silence them. And he says, why? Don't you understand? Don't you understand? That this is what children do in the presence of Jehovah. Didn't you read Psalm 8 verse 2? But 
they're praising you, Jesus. Yes, because I'm Jehovah in their midst. They recognize who I am. Unlike you, my enemies, you still don't know who I am. Clear? Do you see it now? Yeah, but Jesus said, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. See, you don't worship Jesus. Is it clear that what Jesus said in Matthew 4.10, that you are to worship the Lord your God and serve him only, ends up proving the Trinity and proving Jesus is the God-man? Because Jesus is being worshipped as God, and he's not condemning it, he's not rebuking it, he's accepting it. Now, I'll give you a final one for tonight. Well, no, I think I'll give you two. Let me give you two. Matthew 9, 37 to 38. This one is a little subtle. You won't catch it if you're not paying attention. The reason why I wore this Bruce Lee shirt is because anytime I'm going to take out someone and decimate him for the glory of Jesus, I get Bruce Lee on them. I do Jeet Kune Do of apologetics on them. And today it was Adnan. Okay, Matthew 9, 37, 38. Okay, watch here. Matthew 9, 37, 38. Let's see if you guys are going to catch this. Okay. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest, is, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Did you guys catch it? That's like saying, Sai Christian, Muhammad can take me and CP in a debate. That's how bad your comparison is. Okay, Matthew 9, 37, 38. Focus now. Matthew 9, 37, 38. Focus again on what you're about to read. The day Muhammad can defeat Christian Prince of me in a debate is the day Chuck Norris can beat Bruce Lee. Okay, but now focus for the glory of Jesus. Matthew 9, 37, 38. Notice what Jesus said. Then he said to his disciples... The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, let's unpack this. Jesus said, Jesus said, it's ripe. There are people ready to get saved, but we don't have enough workers, meaning evangelists. Pray the Lord of the harvest. Pray the Lord of the harvest sends out laborers to get people saved because they're ready to get saved, right? So notice they are to pray to the Lord of the harvest, and then the Lord of the harvest will send them out, right? Right? Are you catching this? The Lord of the harvest will send out the workers into the world, into the harvest to get people saved. But here's where I'm going to get confused. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. Who is the Lord who sends out laborers into the harvest? Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. Awesome. We know you converted to Satanism and Satanic worship and follow a filthy woman raping, woman whoring pedophile named Muhammad, but don't ever announce it to the world because we're going to shame you. Okay. Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. Pay attention. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out. He gave them power. He, Jesus, gave them authority. Over unclean spirits to cast out demons, cast out Muhammad and Muhammad's father into hell, and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. So Jesus can give you power to cast out demons like Muhammad and his God Allah, and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. Now the name of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labias, whose surname was Thaddeus. Now watch here. Watch here. Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now notice verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you will receive, freely give. You guys didn't catch it. 
Matthew 9.38, Matthew 9.38 with Matthew 10, verse 5. You guys didn't catch it. Matthew 9.38 with Matthew 10, verse 5. Watch here. Let's see who caught it. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Send out laborers. These 12 Jesus sent out. Matthew 10, 16. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, guys, as I've told David Wood, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. If it's the Lord of the harvest who sends out laborers into his field, and you are to pray to the Lord of the harvest, but in the next chapter, Jesus is sending out the disciples into the field to get people saved. Does this mean... Jesus is the Lord of the harvest, whom they are to pray to? So you are to pray to Jesus, who's the Lord of the harvest? And you're going to tell me that in Matthew, Jesus doesn't say to worship him as God? Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers in his field. Next chapter, I send you out. Jesus sent them out. And then he gives them power to raise the dead, to cast out evil spirits and heal diseases and get people saved. He gives them the power to do it in his name. Jesus, who do you think you are? Guys, focus. Don't let Muhammad and Muhammad's father, the devil, distract you. Are you seeing clear-cut proof from Matthew? Jesus claims to be God and is worshipped as God? Are you seeing it or no? So who's the Lord of the harvest? Jesus. Who is the Lord that you pray to to send out workers in his harvest? Jesus. Now I'm going to give you another one to prove to you Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. I'm going to give you another one. But here I need you to read carefully. And I might have to end it with that. Yeah, I'm going to have to save Matthew 14 for another time. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to end it with this one. Are you ready? This shows you now Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. And therefore he is the Lord that you pray to, to send out his workers into the field. In other words, Jesus is claiming to be the God who is worthy of our worship and praise. Okay, let me give you a final one. Are you ready for a final one? You ready for a final one? We had a good crowd, over 170. Yes, we had about over 120. Keep praying. I want to see more people for the glory of Christ. Okay, we got to read the parable, but you got to read with me. Okay, read with me. And you got to read slowly so you don't miss the connection. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Read with me now, guys. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. I don't know why you're putting Matthew 13, 24. Amen. Right. Lead us and fill us with the Spirit. Okay, read now. Guys, read. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Guys, pay attention. A man sowed good seed in his field. So here's a man, and the field is his. The man owns the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner, so the servants of the owner, so the owner who owns the field has servants. 
And the servants come to him and say to him, Sir, the word is Lord. Lord, did you not sow good seed in your field? In your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Now notice what the owner of the field, the man who owns the field, says to his servants. Pay attention. 29 to 30. But he said, No. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Let the tares and the wheat. And by the way, this particular wheat and tare in the beginning stages looks identical. In the beginning stages, this particular wheat and tare, you can't tell them apart. So what is he saying? No, don't do that because you accidentally may tear up the wheat. But when harvest comes and they're fully blossomed, then you can tell the difference. So wait until they're fully blossomed so you can tell the difference between this wheat and the tare. Then gather the tare. Let both grow up until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them up in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So notice, the man, it's his barn. I own the barn. It's my field. They're my servants, right? Okay, the man, he owns the field, he owns the barn, he owns the servants. Now, guys, Matthew 13, let's read 36 to 38 for starters. Matthew 13, 36 to 38. Pay attention. Jacob, can you stop about Muhammad before I block you, man? Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Now watch this. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. Oh boy. Now here's what I'm going to have you do. Post Matthew 13, 24 and 27. Matthew 13 verse 24 and 27 with Matthew 13, 37 and 38. Let's see if you make the connection. Matthew 13, 24 and 27, and Matthew 13, 37, 38. Okay. A man who sowed good seed in his field. The servants came to the owner and said, did you not sow good seed in your field? Who is the man? What is the field? He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. Did you catch what Jesus just said? I am that man who owns the field, and the field is the world, so I own the world and everything in it. I am the Lord of the world. I own the world. Everything in it belongs to me. Did you catch it? This guy's like on a Muhammad fest. Everything evil is Muslims because no Muslims can get saved according to the Protestant believer. Keep it up, Protestant. Keep up the great work of loving Muslims to bring them into the kingdom. Okay, did you catch what Jesus just said? Who is the Lord of the harvest? Jesus. Who is the owner of the field? Jesus. What is the harvest? What is the field? The world. So Jesus owns the world. He's the Lord of the world and everything in it belongs to him. Are you catching it? Now let's finish Jesus' explanation of the parable because I'm going to end it with that. Matthew 13, 37, 36 to 43. Matthew 13, 36 to 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us, the parable of the tares of the field. Now, notice the explanation. Here's where I really want you to pay attention because now I'm going to explain what our Lord is saying. Our Lord is saying, He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's the man who owns the field. The field is the world. So Jesus owns the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. You are Jesus' planting. By His Spirit, He preaches the word. In order for you to be a child of God, you are the planting of Jesus if you're a child of God. Now watch here. 
The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked. The tares are the evil ones who don't believe in Jesus. They belong to Satan. Satan is their father. The sons of the wicked. So either God is your father or Satan is your father. God is either your father or Satan is your father. That's what Jesus said. Sons of the wicked. Now let's read 39. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels. So Jesus not only owns the servants, not only owns the world, he owns the angels. The son of man will send out his angels, right? And they will gather out of his kingdom. So the angels belong to Jesus, the son of man. God's kingdom belongs to the son of man, who's Jesus. The world belongs to the son of man, who's Jesus. What doesn't he, doesn't he own? But let's finish. The son of man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those that practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So Jesus' kingdom is his father's kingdom. His father's kingdom is Jesus' kingdom. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. No, Jesus wasn't a man. He just appeared in a phantom body, Snips. He wasn't born of a virgin to become a flesh and blood human being. Okay, did everyone catch it? See the question this guy's asking me? Jesus was a man? No, he, he was just, you know, a phantom body. Okay, now. Let me explain. Who appeared in my body? What in the world are you talking about, Phantom? Okay. Oh, that's what you mean. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Now let me explain what Jesus is saying here. The sons of the devil will coexist with us till the very end of the age. <clears throat> you know what that means? No Christian has a right to kill an unbeliever because he doesn't believe in Jesus. In other words, this command of Jesus shows you why we're not Muslim jihadis. Did you catch it? He says to the servants, don't destroy them. Wait till the end of the age and the angels will gather all the wicked and throw them in hell. In other words, whether you like it or not, folks, God has destined that we coexist with evildoers to the end of the age and we have no business killing them for refusing to believe in Jesus. That doesn't mean you don't punish criminals. You don't punish murderers. That's the job of the government. And it doesn't mean you don't have a right to defend your life and your life of your loved ones against someone who's trying to murder you or your loved ones or even rape them or harm them. That's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is you cannot kill, you cannot harm an unbeliever simply because he's an unbeliever. That's not your job. You need to learn to coexist with them till the end, and at the end, I will clean house. In other words, there are no Christian jihadis in Jesus' kingdom. He's not Muhammad, and Muhammad's God, who is the devil. You get it? You get it now? That's why the church was never given the authority to kill people who reject the gospel. You preach, you pray, you try to influence them. If they reject, that's between them and God. That doesn't mean criminals and evildoers go unpunished. That's why you have civil authorities. The only sad thing is we live in a fallen world where civil authorities do not fear God and embolden the wicked and justify their sin. But God's going to clean house with these civil authorities as well. So I'm not saying you don't have a right to defend your life 
and the life of your loved ones. Jesus is not saying you can't do that. That's a different story. Someone breaks in your house and wants to murder you and rape your children. You have a right to take them out. And if it means you have to shoot them in order to save your family, that's your God-given right. What you don't have a right to do is to kill someone for rejecting the gospel. You get my point? Now, how does this condemn Muhammad? If Jesus owns the world and everything in it, that means he owns all Muslims and their prophet. Muhammad exists for Jesus. He's Jesus' property. But because Muhammad refused to acknowledge Jesus, he's one of the sons of the devil whom Jesus has now sent to hell where he deserves to go. Snips, I have a right to kick your aspirations if you keep using foul language because I want to muzzle you and your mother for giving birth to you. So is that clear? Biblically speaking, Yeshua, murder means the unlawful taking of a human life. Not the lawful taking of a human life. What's almost every day, Paul? What do you mean? I was saying almost every day. You're talking to somebody, say Christian, who's Paul. Did that make sense? And did you see ample evidence? Did you get more evidence that the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do prove Jesus is not the Father, he's not the Holy Spirit. He's the Son of the Father who works with the Spirit, but he's God Almighty in the flesh. One with the Father and the Spirit in essence, because the Synoptic Gospels are Trinitarian Gospels, not just John. And that Jesus receives the worship due to God alone. Is that clear? Did you get ample proof from Matthew and these parables in Matthew? And also the Old Testament citation that the Jewish scribes cited, Micah 5.2. That the ruler of Israel will be born in Bethlehem. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem exactly as the prophet said. All of these lines of evidence from Matthew. We haven't even looked at Luke yet. Watch what's going to happen when you go to Luke and Acts. God willing, Lord Jesus willing. All of these verses, Old Testament prophecies, parables. Jesus' use of Psalm 8 too, A psalm where David says, children will praise Jehovah to silence his enemies. And Jesus quotes that psalm to justify children praising him in the presence of his enemies who are so stupid and blind that they fail to realize that Jesus is their Jehovah whom they have to worship. All of these lines of evidence prove Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. That's why we're Trinitarians. So we thank you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, sooner than later, modern author. Keep praying for me, my daughters, that God will fight for me and vindicate me and save me from this corrupt system. Save my daughters from their immoral mother and her boyfriend so I can raise them in godliness, not to be exposed to immorality. The Lord will discipline her. Pray for my health. Pray for me to get holier. Pray for the provision of support to do this. You can do it via Patreon and PayPal. And maybe one of the brothers, sisters can post the link. Lord willing, tomorrow I go live with David Wood. And I think he wants to go live again around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time. Either 3 or 4 p.m. But if you want to know when I go live, find me on Facebook. I have two accounts, Ben Malik and Sam Shamoon. Find me, friend request me, because I announce when I'm about to go live. Subscribe, hit the like button, spread this channel so more people can come and learn and benefit for the glory of Jesus. I love you for the sake of Jesus. But remember, my love can do nothing for you. It's the love of Jesus that does everything for you by raising up even maggots like me to be used by the Spirit to bless you to fall more in love with Jesus. And we cannot love him enough. Amen? Thank you, Lord Jesus. God bless you. Lord willing, see you tomorrow. Christ is risen, risen indeed.